That's good. <laughs> Great. All good. Sorry about that. Um, so this is just to point out the co-authors and the project from which this is taken, which is called A Global Anthropology of Transforming Marriage, funded by the ERC. So um, this is a, a jointly written paper, and I'll tell you a little bit about the project. And as I've said, this comes from an introduction to a book that I'm going to mention. So um, our work set out to look at marriage in very particular places and conditions, the HIV AIDS epidemic in Botswana, economic austerity in Greece, religious and political contestations over same-sex marriage in the US, complex geopolitical relations between Taiwan and China, the civil war in Sri Lanka, and rapid middle classification in Malaysia. So our studies were conceived, planned and undertaken in conversation with each other. And we worked together to explore the themes that have been raised in our cases and to consider their divergences. We found unexpected congruences as well as differences as we've moved between the contexts of our work. And one unexpected thing that we hadn't thought about before, but which you're going to hear a little bit about, is um, the fact that our cases share backgrounds of colonialism, uh, anti-colonial struggle and or civil war. So that stimulated a line of inquiry that we hadn't really um, thought about beforehand. But crucially, our project began by suspending the commonly held assumptions that the state is the main driver of changes to familial and intimate life, and that the family is a sphere of conservatism. Instead, from the outset, we took seriously the possibility that intimate and familial realms may produce wider change across a range of significantly different contexts. So we've been particularly interested in the transformative qualities of marriage, its simultaneously conservative and innovative potential and the uncertainties and ambiguities that they produce. Ah, now, I can't move this on. Ah, I've moved it on, okay. Right, sorry about that. So our co-written book, which you can see the cover of here, showing uh, a, a pair being photo for their marriage in front of some Cold War ruins, uh, on uh, Jinmen Island in Taiwan. So this book will be out in September. Um, so our, our book begins with assessing the relative merits of different, uh, sorry, our, our book suggests that marriage is itself a comparative ethical project. And that project begins with assessing the relative merits of different partners and considering different ideas about what marriage is and ought to be in imagining or planning a future marriage, narrating a present one or assessing a marriage's history, explicit and implicit comparisons are made to other marriages, often of parents and grandparents, other relatives and consociates. Lives before and after marriage are compared. Marital histories are set alongside the imagined path not taken. These comparisons invoke at evaluative assessments and offer morally inflected benchmarks of success or failure. And those apparently personal assessments and judgments about marriage through time have a political potential. Thus, our work illuminates the centrality of the past, present and future tense in which the imaginative and relational possibilities of marriage are lived which are central to its ethical and practical possibilities, in other words, its capacity for change. Our case studies consider different aspects of contemporary marriage in six very different cultural contexts. The first is Botswana, uh, studied by Corrine Rees, who you can see on the left of uh, that image. Um, Botswana the others are the United States, Greece, Taiwan, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. And each takes a very different entry point. Um, on the theme of the transformations produced by marriage, Karine Rees investigates how in Botswana, 
passing on customary law in wedding ceremonies creates opportunities to change gendered and generational relationships and to make selves, but also to constitute and distinguish the state, the polity and family in the context of an apparent crisis of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Developing the theme of advice giving, Siobhan McGee, who you can see looking a bit puzzled here in this image, uh, depicts how premarital counselling in the state of Virginia in the US provides a set of discourses for understanding the precepts on which marriage should be founded. Counselling illuminates tensions between an ideal in which two individuals, heterosexual and opposite sex, in accordance with dominant conservative Christian discourses and ideologies, come together and merge their interests, and one in which the individual is deemed to have primacy above other bonds. Tensions between politics, family and the self are palpable in the southern US, and they are explored further by Irini Papadaki in her project on marriage in Greece. Under conditions of economic austerity in Athens, these tensions are manifested in an evolving notion of what it means to compromise in political and relational and affective terms through different generations of 20th and 21st century families. Chao Chao Chu pursues a different tack by considering the apparent difficulty of getting married and a trend towards delayed marriage in contemporary Jinmen, an island of Taiwan. These trends, which are partly associated with women's increased education and participation in the workforce, are matched only by the difficulties of not marrying. Getting married becomes a trial here in multiple senses of the word. The Sri Lankan Tamil case, which I'm not going to talk about in very much detail because it wasn't part of our original project, but it is very interesting. It concerns a much more extreme case of difficulty in marrying, transnational marriages contracted in the aftermath of prolonged war and disruption. Marriage is crucial here to envisaging a future that can transform the losses of warfare and upheaval, but it must be performed in particular ways to safeguard the requirements of international immigration controls. Finally, the life stories of two women in Penang, Malaysia, from my own ethnographic project, call the place of marriage in upward class mobility into question. Rather than providing the linchpin for a success for a successful life, marriage here is one of many avenues in already advancing trajectories of self-fashioning, raising questions about what marriage obscures as well as what it enables. So the first proper section is on hierarchies of mar marriage. All of our cases illuminate how the hierarchy Sorry, I'm having a little trouble uh, with the PowerPoint here. Ah, okay. All of our cases illuminate how the hierarchy of relations within marriage resonates with and animates more explicitly political relations. Marriage incorporates, produces, and reproduces further hierarchies, including those of economy and class. Hierarchy is, of course, deeply embedded in marriage and takes multiple forms. Perhaps the most apparent of these is the hierarchy of gender. Kareen Rees discusses the ceremony of giving the law in Botswana as a part of the wedding ceremonies in which a bride is given instruction on the proper way to behave as a wife in the precepts of customary law. Suggestively, the instruction is both public in that it takes place in the front of a crowd of women and simultaneously secret in that the bride is hidden under a blanket and much of it is delivered in whispers that are inaudible to those assembled. As Rees emphasizes, however, the ceremony of Paplo giving the law is not simply one in which Setswana law is imparted as an age old tradition, rather there's scope for creativity and innovation, perhaps all the more so, since witnesses cannot always be sure what instructions have been issued. Thus her argument isn't so much about the inculcation of hierarchy, but a more subtle one about how marriage may also disrupt it 
and provide a means by which the law is actually produced and changed. The performative aspects of such instruction are important since there can be no doubt that by the time she becomes a bride, a young Setswana woman will already have had ample opportunity to observe and understand the customary ways that women and men should behave towards each other. These may be silently conveyed and remain unarticulated as, as uh, household members go about their everyday tasks, but they're also reflected upon explicitly in the everyday negotiation of interpersonal conflict. Siobhan McGee shows how the premarital instruction that couples in Lynchburg, Virginia receive from pastors or others, which inculcates the virtues of not getting angry at one's spouse for the minor irritations of marital life, have a similar element of performance. They also build on subtler forms of socialization at home and in religious practice, including at church. So whether it's the importance of wives staying away from mobile phones in Botswana, or the question of how to deal with a husband who, quote, leaves his undershorts on the floor in Virginia, instruction and counseling set explicit standards which reflect on and seek to shape the practical hierarchies of everyday life. Irini Papadaki's work on Greece and Chao Chao Chu's on Jinmen Taiwan make clear how the hierarchical conventions on which marriage is based may shift more or less dramatically in just a few generations. In the Greek case, the gendered hierarchy of marriage in a strongly patriarchal context emerged clearly in ethnographies of village life in the mid 20th century. But as Papadaki shows, contemporary middle class Athenians, and particularly women, voice concerns about the compromises married life imposes in terms of a loss of self, rather than in terms of their subjugation as women. This discourse is one that registers the effective gains and losses of marriage. It is articulated in ways that acknowledge but also bypass feminist understandings of marital relations. Part of the story of the resilience of marriage in the Greek context has to do with the social recognition that it affords women in particular, and the difficulty of achieving that recognition outside marriage. In the Taiwanese case, the early to mid 20th century expectation that marriage involved the thoroughgoing incorporation of a wife into her husband's natal household and patrilineage has been mitigated as women are increasingly able to delay marriage, work independently, and continue to reside with their parents while apparently contemplating having children on their own. The persistence of patrilineal and patriarchal values in Jin Men, alongside the possibility of remaining unmarried and now of same-sex marriage in Taiwan, which was instituted in 2019, suggests substantial changes and ambiguities in gender relations. A shift in gender hierarchies here intersects with changes in intergenerational ones as adult children follow their own wishes in marriage and are less subject to parental control, but still maintain relations of respect and values of filial piety. This, in fact, this image that you're seeing in front of you is from uh, Chao Chao's fieldwork in Jin Men, and it's from someone's front living room, just beside the ancestral altar. There's a series of fantastic collages of um, family photographs, which I took pictures of. Marriage is central to the reproduction of the family and simultaneously legally constituted by the state has a critical role in, in the intersection of the domains of state and family and in the institution and reproduction of these hierarchies. In both the southern US and in Botswana, as in many other contemporary cultures, proper relations between husband and wife are part of what is taught to couples prior to marriage. This formal teaching is not only an ethical matter, but a political undertaking. As well as being publicly or semi-publicly imparted, the precepts of gendered hierarchy in marriage are also implicitly referenced and underpin other forms of hierarchy, including that between the family and the state. So the next uh, section is on separations and erasures and comparisons. Rather than understanding the 
realms of social life condensed in marriage as organized in some prefigured order of scales of encompassment, we instead explore these separations as effects of ideologies of modernity, which have the capacity to make such hierarchies appear self-evident. It is through the active separation of spheres of the family and state, the intimate and the political, that this hierarchy is embedded, internalized and naturalized. This domaining process emerges in several of our studies. In the Botswana case, we see how the parallel systems of civil and customary law merge and are embedded in marriage as much as their separation is produced by marriage in what we suggest are a kind of ordinary ethics. Law, as she argues, is a way of making distinctions of legal forms, of gender, of generation, kinship and politics. But here it seems that what the law does is enact distinctions that are otherwise obscure and in so doing it produces them. The allusion to ordinary ethics from Corrine Reese's work is apt because, as several of our cases show, marriage is inevitably a process that requires comparative assessments and judgments, which are crucial for the ways that hierarchies, distinctions, separations and exclusions are produced and reproduced. This dynamic is made explicit in the premarital counselling in Virginia which I've spoken about, where the kinds of marriages advocated by conservative Christians are actively discussed in religious and simultaneously personal terms. Advice implicitly incorporates and inculcates gendered models of behavior, and it either implicitly or explicitly excludes certain forms of marriage. As McGee indicates, there's a powerful history in play here. Until the US Supreme Court judgment on Loving versus Virginia in 1967, marriage across racial lines was illegal in Virginia. This 1967 ruling was drawn on as a precedent in the subsequent Supreme Court judgment, making it illegal to ban same-sex marriage in 2015. Certain forms of marriage are thus not only beyond the purview of conservative Christian counseling, they have historically been outside the law. In the US, the law forecloses some possibilities, even as it expands others. And this is one reason that historians of the US have seen marriage as a central institution and metaphor of the nation. The work of ordinary ethics in marriage does not necessarily need to be the subject of explicit instruction, although this may occur. Our essays also show how marriage inevitably enfolds everyday ethical judgments and comparison as it's envisaged, planned, described and narrated. The life stories of two upwardly mobile women of different generations and ethnic backgrounds in Penang, Malaysia, in my own work, traces how the comparisons of their own marriages with those of others, especially of close family members, is woven through their narratives. The, narrative, the narratives illuminate how the everyday or ordinary is suffused with ethics. Marriage provides an expansive ground for making ethical assessments, and these, these come to constitute life stories. Such comparative judgments evaluate relations in both positive and negative terms, with or without reference to religious precepts or discourses about love. This tendency reminds us that kinship and relatedness might be the most obvious realm of everyday life through which ethics are imaginatively and practically lived. Far from providing a teleologically a teleological story of the rise of autonomous individuals and the progressive marginalization of kinship in institutions of modernity, our cases collectively show how marriage and kinship more broadly make innovation possible. In the case of Athenian middle-class women, Papadaki shows how assessments pertain to the self and the imagination and the imaginative consideration of lives not lived, roads not taken. 
but the manner in which such imaginary paths are balanced against the actuality of family life uh, with children are suggestive of the ways that love and care, even when they're not directly spoken of, are part of the everyday ethics of marriage. In Jin Men, Chu's discussion of the trials endured by young people who delay marriage makes clear that the alternatives of marrying and not marrying must be understood beside other generational shifts in forms of marriage and in gender relations. A delayed marriage, amongst other things, means that single women continue to live with and support their parents. This choice may occasion conflict, negotiation, accommodation and compromise between generations, incorporating other forms of economic and effective care in turn. Here we sense divergent models for marriage embedded in different versions of gender and generational hierarchy and cross-cut by changing educational and employment opportunities for women. Rather than see these tensions in terms of direct competition, it might be more plausible to look for measured adjustments, the compromises articulated by couples in Athens, for instance. Such scenarios and their accommodations are suggestive too of the cruel optimism that Laurent, Lauren Berlant talks about, that, attend, that attention to personal desire may connote. At the limits, individual marriage, marriages may break. The recently instituted possibility of same-sex marriage in Taiwan suggests that everyday gossip and judgments about unmarried people's behavior, which Chu documents for Jin Men, must over time incorporate subtle shifts in the valuation of norms and conventional behavior. These, as we show, flow and ricochet between individuals, families and communities. They have profound implications for transformations in marriage and for the further transformations these may produce. So the next section is on material histories and marital histories. And as you may have noticed, I'm having some problems with shifting the PowerPoint, so I hope I can get this coordinated. The fact that marriage may come to stand for the nation and that its forms are crucially linked to and framed by legal and religious enactments should not lead us to assume that the state thereby exercises full control of marriage and its changing practice. Because of the intimate relational and everyday dimensions of its lived experience, kinship always exceeds or evades state attempts at regulation. State and other institutionalized attempts to shape marriage and the evasions and innovations that emerge in spite and because of them, thus provide complementary perspectives on national, familial and personal histories. The thoroughgoing reform of Greek family law, which was enacted in 1983, for example, was an attempt to institutionalize gender equality in terms of marital property, relations and familial authority. But it's not at all clear whether in enacting this far reaching reform, the Greek government was attempting to drive social change forward or was catching up with wider changes in attitudes and practices that were already manifest by the time of the fall of the Greek junta in 1974. To take another example from our studies, one could suggest that the US Supreme Court judgments of 1967 and 2015, respectively making it illegal for states to ban interracial and same-sex marriage, were responding to widespread shifts in attitudes rather than simply prescribing new ways of doing marriage. These interpretive possibilities raise wider questions about the transformations marriage undergoes and produces and their implications for historicizing social analysis. One striking aspect of our cases, as I've said, is that they share historical backgrounds of colonialism, anti-colonial struggle and or civil war. In Virginia, the shadow of the American Civil War stretches from a rather distant past, but the prominence of Civil War monuments in Lynchburg, Virginia, including the Confederate section of, his, of the, its historic cemetery, which you can see here, and which is interestingly a picturesque wedding site, belies this distance. 
Nearby in the university town of Charlottesville, as elsewhere in the American South, such monuments are heavily contested. The history of this war remains a contemporary concern, as you can see here. In Jinmen, situated at the literal front line of civil war in China and the ensuing prolonged Cold War, military sites and museums across the island are pervasive commemorative markers on the landscape. As Papadaki and Karsten's work also shows, even where such history is less physically memorialized, as in the Greek and Malaysian cases, condensed instead in the interstices, gaps and silences of state monuments, it can nevertheless be traced in family histories and narratives. These two pictures are from the Greek military museum, you'll be interested to know, in Athens where we didn't expect to find Korea mentioned. The prominence of commemorative sites and monuments draws our attention to the role of material sites and artifacts in connecting memories of personal and familial loss in warfare with the nation. Histories of marriage are generally less visible uh, than those of warfare in the stories nations tell about themselves, but the power of objects and place to evoke effective qualities and past experience is equally crucial in marriage and has some similar qualities. So the picture you're seeing here is of an exhibition we did um, last year, it seems about 10 years ago, in the Edinburgh Public Library and there's a website, um, but it's an anthropology of weddings. Uh, exhibition. It's not accidental that venues, costumes, jewellery, food, photographs and other material items should feature prominently in the planning and description of weddings, as uh, many people have noted and is noted uh, by our exhibition. All have the capacity to condense and evoke the effective qualities associated with marriage. In this respect, the possibility of celebrating a wedding in a Confederate cemetery in Lynchburg, this is the Confederate monument in Lynchburg, in the cemetery itself, might perhaps seem less incongruous. The rituals of marriage evoke the past, but they look towards and make possible a new future. This evocation happens in everyday registers as well as ritual ones. In my ethnography from Penang, the recuperation or recollection of objects that recall a lost childhood can materialize a vision of continuity in a life and marriage that have been disrupted by upward mobility and achievement. In these and other ways, we show the importance of material objects in reference to place in the transmission of the past into the present and future. And here we draw on work by Troutman, Feely, Harnick and Mitani, which considers the deep history of kinship and focuses on houses and food as evoking memories and emotional responses through their association with patterns laid down in childhood. But it also includes other items, jewelry, pots, clothing, kinship terminologies and genealogies which, as they suggestively argue, are part of the heavy, heavy memory work that operates through kinship. Such objects, whether as gifts or trousseaus, are often an important focus of betrothal and wedding rituals. A bridal bouquet and wedding gown, for example, may be passed on or lovingly preserved, carrying their condensed meanings to bind relations over time and space and to history. There's a sh two more short sections. The first is on temporalities of marriage. Andrew Schreier has suggested that we should consider kinship as a special mode of travel, a way to engineer secure social landscapes and reliable histories. This formulation underlines the centrality of imaginative time travel to the capacities of marriage and of kinship and also resonate with Laura Baer's more recent discussion of the heterochrony or multiplicity of modern time. But rather than the focus on the exceptional qualities of time under modernity, we connect such temporal entanglements to the way that marriage affords opportunities for and encompasses ethical judgments about relations. We could see these assessments 
as part of a kind of comparative time travel within and between generations. Time travel is silently enabled through the deployment of material forms with strong affective and ethical resonances, as in the wedding celebrations depicted in several of our cases. In figuring out how best to do marriage in the present, prospective spouses, as well as those who narrate a conjugal life retrospectively, look forward and backward in time. There are moments in planning and enacting a marriage when such ethical evaluations and their inherent timescapes become especially palpable. Betrothal, marital dispute or divorce mark such moments of high tension when marriage comes into being or risks being torn apart. Notably, bet betrothal often takes a heavily ritualized form in which doing things in the prescribed manner matters. Betrothal, one might say, is an imaginary, imaginary time travel into the future that is built on or pretends to a recapitulation of the past. In divorce, it is not only for economic reasons, I think, that items of marital property with their heavy symbolic and emotional freight are the focus of contention. Divorce is a rupture in the present. It requires the unpicking of the past to enable participants to move forward. Time is central to Tom Ballstorff's discussion of contestations over the implications of same-sex marriage in the US using the lens of queer theory. Ballstorff argues that straight time, with its linear assumptions of biography in terms of progression, imposes a heteronormative understanding of marriage as necessarily reproducing patern patriarchy. In this reading, same-sex marriage appears as an inherently conservative or regressive innovation, consolidating and legitimizing the role of the state and heteronormativity. Bolstor proposes instead to destabilize straight time, as he puts it, to queer it, in fact. Bringing to bear alternative regimes of temporality, he suggests, might, I quote, make possible contingent, ironic, and above all imbricated stances towards structures of domination, end of quote. Drawing on his discussion, we suggest that rather than understanding same-sex marriage to encapsulate some singular quality distinct from all other marriage, all marriages have the capacity to take place in what he calls coinc coincidental or queer time. While opposite sex marriage undoubtedly participates in and reproduces state institutions and normative framings, it also carries with it the possibility of being reimagined and, re and enacted in new ways. This reformulation occurs through the simultaneous imagining, comparison and ev evocation of other and alternative scenarios in past, present and future. So the last conclusion bit is called conjugal transformations. Perhaps the most profound change that marriage has undergone in recent times is the legalization of same-sex marriage in some places at least. Whether in Ireland, Taiwan, Costa Rica or the US, such developments would not have been foreseen just a few decades ago. They raise the questions, how do transformations in marital forms occur and how do they propel further social change? Our work provides instances of other shifts in gender relations and marital forms evident in contemporary marriage, and it indicates too the tensions that emerge around new ways of doing marriage. Changes to how marriage is judged and imagined may, may occur incrementally through the ways people consider and talk about themselves and others. Change may be welcomed in some quarters and resisted in others. The US Supreme Court judgments on so-called interracial and same-sex marriage discussed by McGee were the outcome of a considerable political struggle and are still heavily contested zones rather than an indication of the inexorable and inevitable march of liberal reform. All of our cases illustrate how the institution of marriage and the content of conjugal relations may display striking degrees of ambiguity and uncertainty. Marriage as an institution is extraordinarily hard to pin down, but another way of depicting this elusiveness would be to say that it is an unusual, unusually flexible and expansive institution. It can take many forms, sim sometimes simultaneously. This might provide one counterintuitive response 
to Lauren Berlant's question, which she asks, what does it mean about love that its expressions tend to be so, uh, that its expressions tend, tend to be so conventional, so bound up in institutions like marriage and family, property relations and uh, stock phrases and plots. Rather than only normalizing domest and domesticating desire, as Berlant suggests, our project shows how marriage also has the potential to resist or enlarge what constitutes the normal. By placing our cases side by side, we've been able to reflect on the resonances between them. Collectively, our cases show the simultaneous conservatism and innovation that marriage instantiates and allows. They suggest that it's partly through its apparent cloak of conformity that innovation is made possible. And this may help to explain the intense attention paid to the conventional enactment of ritual as betrothals, at betrothals and weddings. Whether in the secret advice given to brides in Botswana, in the implicit comparisons made between marriages over several generations in Malaysia, or the gossip and rumours circulating about unmarried single people in Jinmen, Taiwan, understandings about the proper way to behave in relationship circulate another subject of moral judgments and comparative evaluation. These judgments have the capacity gradually to become a part of a wider, uh, wider field of accepted and acceptable behaviour. Seen in this light, same-sex marriage can appear as both an inherently conservative move and a radical innovation. The legal right to gay marriage provides, as we've seen, a rare instance when the simultaneity of these aspects become strikingly apparent. Uh, we've suggested that it's partly through the work of ordinary ethics, everyday comparisons, that transformations occur in and through marriage. We see marriages, in other words, as both imaginative projections and arrangements of the power, in Phyllis Rose's words. Here we push back against understandings of the state as the overriding driver of change. While marriage is undoubtedly a political institution, subject to controls exerted by the modern state, its power derives from the fact that it is also an expression of familial, individual and effective lives that exceed those controls. Making marriages involves families, couples and individuals creatively planning a future, one they often hope to make different from the past, but paradoxically also similar. Inescapably, they draw on and sometimes adjust rituals that have been passed down through generations or have the appearance of having done so. Spouses adopt and remake ways of celebrating a wedding, and they also yeah. consider their own conjugal relationship in the light of others, especially those of their parents, close family members and consociates. Given the commemorative and imaginative possibilities in play, and the evaluations and investments entails, it's not surprising that marriages are fraught with a potential for considerable family tensions. It is in this broad sense that we understand marriage as both transforming and transformative and as, and as occurring in past, present and future tense. That's it. I'm going to stop my screen sharing. Sorry, that for some reason that didn't, um, it was very hard to manipulate the slideshow, I don't know why. Sorry so about that. that. It wasn't all well coordinated, but you saw was, most of it, or one or two of it. We enjoyed it, I assure you. Okay, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much, Janet. That was a very interesting um, and stimulating presentation. And I'm just looking to see if I don't think um, there are already questions. 